Hey guys, I'm Mike. Um, so I come from a pretty technical background. I have an undergrad degree in robotics and a master's degree in computer science. Um, my, my path to uh, Facebook PM, I actually was an intern at Facebook three years ago, software engineering intern. And my team happened to be a little bit understaffed in the product manager department. Um, so this was an opportunity for me to kind of uh, step up and try some of these exercises like working with designers, working with marketing, working with sales, working cross-functionally and understanding how are the different requirements and how that influenced me in the project I was building. So from that, became a PM intern at a different company and came back to Facebook uh, after I finished my master's. Hi everyone, I'm Lizzie. Um, I came into product management by way of analytics and data science. I actually did that in industry um, after, after school. Uh, so I was doing that, realized that I would think I was interested in doing more cross-functional work, was interested in doing more than just my analytics work, which I loved, but wanted to try something new. So discovered the RPM program and started it this past January. Um, I studied business in college, but worked mostly in design before switching into product management. I think there are a lot of things that I learned to respect and appreciate with the design process, like building products based off of a user problem, going through a very diligent and careful iteration process, but ultimately I wanted to try my hand at not only thinking about how to design better products, but how do we make sure that the, that product ends up in the hands of users through execution. Um, and so that's what made me want to try product management out. I was working at a startup where I had an internship in UI UX, but I had a hunch I would enjoy PM. So I asked the startup if I could get some more product-y responsibilities. Um, so they gave me some analytics uh, jobs and then also worked on specking out a feature as well as designing it. And so that kind of helped me confirm that PM was what I wanted to do and then joined the RPM program right after college graduation. Cool. Um, well, there's a lot that we can dive into, but really we want to know what you guys are curious about um, learning. So don't be shy asking questions. We're here as a resource for you. Yeah? So who is your ideal candidate in terms of number of years of experience in product management? Question was ideal candidate uh, in terms of years of experience. So uh, we, I think like Jack said at the beginning, we have a super, super wide range of backgrounds. We have people who come straight out of undergrad, straight out of grad school, straight like, like from industry experience. Um, we have people with anywhere, I think the number is now like five to seven years of experience. Um, so it really is a broad range. It's not, there's no like ideal candidate or typical candidate at all. The only thing that we ask is yeah. that the program is for people new to product management. So uh, you can be working in industry, but if less you have years. product experience, less than two years of product experience. So you say product experience. Yeah. 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 So like if you're in like product analytics, like that wouldn't be considered. Yeah, question back there. Uh, I think you could give a general sense of the curriculum of the same months. And also because you were also part of the Google and the program, how the two compare. You also do that? Sorry, the first question was about the curriculum? Yeah, this is what what is it? Um well, broadly speaking, so we have three six-month rotations. Uh, throughout the program, you have a manager that stays with you for the 18 months. Um, you also have a, I guess, mentor or what we call operational product manager you work with on each of your six-month rotations. So you have kind of two mentors uh, at every step along the process and one that stays with you for the whole 18-month program. Aside from that, there's a variety of like what we call it community events. So we organize what we call learning circles. So you get together with your peers and you chat about your common experiences. So my class, there was 12 RPMs that started uh, August of last year. And this, we split up in two groups of six and every week we'd meet to talk about common problems faced between us. So there's a very much sense of a community uh, amongst the RPMs and like, there's only about 30, I'd say, total RPMs currently. Uh, so it's a very small number. You get to know everyone really well. Uh, other curriculum aspects? Oh, yeah. yeah um we have like other task force where we work on what we call development task force, which is basically like what are the skills that you need to learn and how, what are the different ways we can deliver those skills. One of those is meeting with your peers and learning circles. Another might be like bringing in speakers of more senior product leaders, might be like having dinner with them or lunch with them just to talk about your career development. It really expands, but I'd say like curriculum feels like a off term to use only because like the best way to do it is to actually like throw you in on a rotation and a product team to have you learn in the diverse way that that product team requires you to work as a PM. So whether it's like building a product from scratch zero to one or like diving in with more data and iterating on growth, that's kind of like the curriculum that you select for yourself as the rotations that you pick. Yeah. 
We also do, um, when you start, you do two weeks of our engineering boot camp, and you also go through our full data camp that all of our data scientists and data engineers go through, um, so you get a feel for all of that. We also, um, like our design, our amazing design program has like something they call design for non-designers that like we all go through. Um, so we definitely like take the opportunity that we do have like a cohort to do educational opportunities, but it's also mostly self-driven. Like if like we decide like okay, like we're feeling kind of like I know like a couple years ago they were saying like oh like we don't feel like we have our hand like data data camp was so long ago we like kind of forget some of it so they like did a one day data intensive we like brought in data leaders and product leaders to help learn. Um, and your second question was about Google APM versus Facebook RPM. Uh, so I was an APM intern uh, before I joined Facebook full time. Uh, I think the main thing to consider is like there's like the logistics and the differences between the programs. So Google is two one year rotations, Facebook is three six month rotations. So with that, uh, at Facebook, if you have a rotation you're not super excited about, it's six months. <laughs> at Google, if you have a rotation you're not super excited about, it's one year, and that's half of your rotations. Um, in terms of like company size, Google is roughly 4x the size of Facebook in terms of number of employees. So it's just a bigger company and all the challenges associated with that. Um, I think the other thing is like there's fundamentally product differences between what Google offers and what Facebook offers. So if you're someone who's particularly motivated by like Android, Chrome, uh, Google Maps, like all the different suite that Google offers versus Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, there's fundamentally different products, so whatever excites you more. Um, I think for me, one of the main selling points for Facebook is it's a very fluid company. So as I mentioned before, I was actually an engineering intern who happened to pick up a lot of product management uh, tasks, I guess, along the way. And that's like a very unique opportunity at Facebook where even though your, your role may say you literally this, there's definitely opportunity for you to seek out other opportunities. Um, and work with them, you know, figure out is this something you're interested in, you want to transition. We have a lot of people internally who transition between roles. Uh, even in your class, yeah. your RPM class, there's about five people that Yeah, my class of 14, five of them were digital transfers. From different functions at Facebook to the RPM program. So it's just one of the main selling points, I think, just about the company in general is how fluid it is and how much flexibility there is. Yeah. Um, infrastructure. Um, I see a couple notes about that, but how much do you interact with that in terms of you know telco, infra project, and possibly you know uh, infrastructure and emerging economies, things like that. Uh, like us as PM specifically, or yeah. Facebook as a company. I like uh, Internet.org, you know, as a, as a product. Yeah, so we have our PMs who are on Internet.org products, okay. um, who are on some of our other connectivity work. We also. I think it, it just depends on your product team, like kind of anything, but there are PMs across the org that touch a lot of different infra spaces. So I was on a team last half um, that worked a lot with like our security infra engineers. Um, and it just depends on your team, but we definitely have opportunities. Wherever there's a product team, an RPM can exist. We're not kind of excluded from anything because of the domain or complexity. So you said you have a manager for 18 months, right? So what is his role? I mean, what is the interaction between you both, and what is his responsibilities? Right. Okay. The, the manager is basically there to see your growth through all three rotations. So they know your strengths and weaknesses day one, and they'll know them day you leave the program. And I think to have someone who's there with you throughout that entire journey is very helpful. Uh, ultimately, they're the ones who are like evaluating you and helping you grow to know like how you can become a better PM. Uh, the problem with this is that the, your manager is often not on the team that you're currently rotating on, so that's why we have another manager, PM, who's supporting you more on the day-to-day -day operations. And it's pretty cool to think about the fact that there's like two fairly senior PMs at the company who are focused on you and your growth. Um, so that setup makes it such that every RPM has a lot of support. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the interview process starting from like, the first thing you know, all down to the product sense? So I guess it's important to note if you're actually interested in applying to the RPM program, uh, please do so tonight because the application is actually closed tomorrow. So that's an important caveat for everyone. <laughs> 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 like laptops opening up. <laughs> um, yeah, that's to answer your question, so typically we do I think one or two phone screens to kind of start the process off. Um, the first screen maybe with the recruiter and just asking like why are you interested in product management on Facebook. The second phone screen will be with the product manager who will just ask some like I guess baseline questions about product sense, what you're interested in, like pick some products you like, some products you don't like, etc. Uh, if you get through those rounds, then typically we do on-site interviews. Um, the on-site. So we actually do. So we have the recruiter screener, and then you have two 
uh, video oh, interviews. Yeah. So the process might change. The process changes often. Okay. Um, so we apply during different cycles. Um, so you have a you have a two video interviews with current product managers in product sense and in product execution. Okay. So product sense is like what Mikey said, um, and product execution is more an execution trade offs metrics type interview. Um, and then our on site. So then the onsite, we have three interviews. Uh, the first one is focused on leadership and drive. So this is more of your like soft skills type questions. Uh, tell me about a time you're on a team, what went well, what went wrong, how do you motivate people. Um, the second interview is another product sense interview. So tell me about products you like, products you don't like. If you're the product manager on this Facebook product, what would you do? If you're the product manager on this app, what would you do? Um, and then the third interview is, again, product execution, which is more, I guess, like, Product science is like talk about ideas, talk about what you like. Product execution is diving more into like, if you were the PM on this, what do you think are the most important metrics for your product? Or if you were to launch this experiment, what do you think, what metric would go up, what metric might go down? So it's very like, um, more granular and more focused on the, like, what we call execution. So, to follow up to that. Yeah. Um, so not having any experience in product management, how do you go about preparing um, for specifically the product sense of execution? Um, the leadership ones you can draw from other, um, you know, other experiences in other industries, but the products and the execution one, how do you go about preparing for that? So I think one of the biggest things to note is that because you aren't expected to have a product background, it is about potential. Okay. Um, so like it's not a conversation in general. These there's no right or wrong answer. It's about how you think and how you how you work through problems. Um, so I think the it's more of a I think of them as like problem solving and like what does your intuition say versus like knowing an answer to a project. Like can you say like, hey, if this metric goes up, this metric might be like our quality metric or we make sure that this one doesn't go down at the same time. Like it's more that type of thinking. Yeah. Um, but I don't know about preparation. Well, I mean, I'd say like, this, it's just kind of like uh, product thinking I view as kind of like a muscle. So like for me, when I was doing design work, I was like constantly flexing that muscle and working on it. But there's other ways to do that. Like for example, like if you're like waiting an obnoxious amount of time for an Uber, like are you thinking about maybe ways that Uber as a product could be built better? Or like if you're in line at a grocery store and the waitress and waiters are like all over the place, like what's something that you can do to be better? Just like constantly getting into a rhythm of like recognizing a problem and isolating it and then what's a potential solution. And you can do that like standing in line at the grocery store. I think like there's a bunch of different ways to like constantly be practicing this. That's more for product sense. Um, yeah, and for execution, I think it's more like, are you a logical thinker? Um, which is again, like something that you just kind of like stretch over time and I'm sure with whatever roles or responsibilities you're currently experiencing, there's some kind of way you can figure out how to make that work for you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you share with us a product you worked on and also what was your favorite part about the rotation? Mm -hmm. Another one. You want to start? Okay. Uh, so currently I'm on Messenger Games. Uh, so Facebook has been a gaming company or involved in gaming for a long time, going back to the like, Farmville days for better or for worse. For uh, <laughs> um, and so now we're building up a new platform on Messenger around gaming. So you can imagine that like there's a ton of potential there, but it's a completely new platform. Uh, Facebook, we don't make our own games ourselves. We work with third-party developers a lot, and they have their own ask, and we have to balance that with what we want to build and what they want us to build. So it's like it's a really exciting opportunity because it's literally building a platform from the ground up. Um, and it's like you can think about <laughs> lots of different companies and lots of different challenges. I feel like this is a pretty unique opportunity. I was on our anti-spam team last time, which was, I don't know if I can answer if there was like a favorite part or best part, but it was super, super interesting and I learned a ton. Um, I think like the interactions of what happens like when we don't take something down versus what happens if we take something down wrongly. It's like a very interesting kind of like real problem that people face that like we are just always trying to be better at. Like ideally, right, we have like nothing policy violating on the site and everything that was allowed on the site on the site. Um, so there was definitely like a cool balance of trade-offs of stuff like that. Um, and I think it was something that I had never thought of as being so important. And like you don't think of, you don't think about it unless it goes wrong. Um, and I really liked being on a team that was about if we were doing our job right, no one, no one talked about us. And I thought that was a really unique place to be. Uh, for me, I don't know if it's favorite, but last half I was on the Facebook profile team, and my rotation was focused on basically building a zero to one product, which means like 
I joined the rotation and there was like just an idea, a shell of an idea, and it was my job during the rotation to kind of vet that idea, work with the designer to build a product and eventually ship it, which we did globally by the end of my rotation. So to have been able to see that like end-to-end -end product life cycle just in the span of one rotation was absolutely incredible. Um, so if you make an album that has more than photos, it's because of her. Yes, yes. So I worked on the new Facebook albums product and it was in a space that I was very interested in, which is just like helping people create and share their authentic self, which was really interesting to me. And then right now I'm on a sharing growth team working on new formats to help people share, kind of in a similar vein. One of the products I work on is the really obnoxious like background colors on text posts. Um, we don't have a name for that officially yet, but that's one of the products that I work on, which is really fun to work with because I'm working with like an art team to make those background styles and we're thinking of new ways that we can help people share really lightweight ways. Yeah, new avocado styles, things like that. Super fun. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Uh, as a follow up to your point where like you guys haven't specifically like yeah. can you quickly go over your thought process for like how you guys decided that this is the future you want to add to profiles? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say like the team high level has like a strategy. So every team is gold on a main metric and as a product team you're kind of thinking about what are ways that we can build a new product or adjust the levers to fulfill the goal in the way that we want to. So the profile team had a strategy and so one of these ideas was like to fulfill this strategy why don't we kind of build this product and how do we make sure that that product continues to fulfill the goals that we initially signed up to, to fulfill. That's a very oversimplified version of how it all happened. Yeah. So, um Kind of two questions. One is, as a product manager, um, you know, you've mentioned that each team kind of has their own goals that they're already going for. How much top-down direction do you have where you're implementing versus autonomy to create something completely out of thin air, essentially, based yeah. on an idea your team had? And then uh, second, one, second question is, as far as the rotational program and stuff, you're rotating around the three different teams. How much? say you have in which teams you end up on or do you have like a list where you get to pick like your top 10 choices and then you know you guys kind of match you up to well do you think you'd be better at these or you know how, how does that all work uh so the first question was about like are we just executing on some top down vision or is it up to us to kind of influence well how much of each what's the balance right uh ultimately as a product manager it's up to you to decide what your team works on so uh, quite frequently, you know, our leaders will have opinions about what your team should work on, but we're kind of always taught to like question, like, just because someone said to do something doesn't mean you have to do it. And if you don't understand exactly why they're telling you to do something, you should question it. So, like, as again, as a product manager, you're ultimately responsible for your team's success. It's on you. So you need to understand exactly what you're doing and why it's the most important thing to work on. Um, so that being said, like, there are people with tons of experience at the company who can give you advice on this sort of stuff, but it's, it's up to you to make that decision. I would say there's a lot of autonomy, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. Mike uh, rethought the metric that his team was going on in his first rotation. And, like, that's something, even though the team previously in Top Down had, like, an idea, I'm bragging for you. <laughs> <laughs> even though the team had an idea for what they should be going on, like, he questioned that and then, like, had the autonomy to make that happen. And that means, like, stay in your case, yeah. right? right? So, like, if you think something should change, you better have a really good reason why. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And in terms of like picking rotations, it's very much like a matching process. There's The good news is there's always more projects available than there are actual RPMs. So RPMs have the point of leverage to basically like, we have coffee chats with the PMs who are offering new projects and they're thoroughly vetted. So it should be a very impactful, substantive product. Like frankly, Facebook doesn't have time to have you PM a side project. So projects are very substantial. And then it's just kind of this two week coffee chat, get to know people, it's make your final decision, yeah, it's speed dating. Yeah. And for the most part, RPMs get their first choice uh, because, as Jasmine said, there's more products in their RPMs, and it tends to be that you have people have different opinions about what they'd rather work on, but there's not a lot of conflict. I think going back to also like some of the manager questions earlier, that's like a huge, huge point of having a manager is that I think people make these assumptions like, oh, like these are the projects everyone's going to want, but everyone's trying to grow in different areas, and everyone has like different strengths and different and different areas of opportunity. So you're often picking a rotation. Like especially when you're looking at like oh like going your second you're like oh I got a lot of you know really heavy my last rotation felt like very execution based I really want to like stretch my product sense muscle so I'm gonna try and choose a rotation more like that even if it's really out of my comfort zone because you have this opportunity to be on the team for six months and really just learn and grow like we are this is a growing program like it's a learning program that's what we optimize for first. Awesome. Is there a rotational program in the hardware group building eight? 
I have not had any projects offered for RPMs there yet, though RPMs have landed there yeah. after afterwards. After. Yeah. Okay. There are many former RPMs who are working there. The Open Gate is also relatively new as well. Um, I think it was just within the last year the way that, right, that it was kind of created. So at some point in the future, maybe. Yeah. They also have a different work structure than kind of other things. Yes. Could you share uh, what's the most important quality of the product manager? There's not one, I think. That's the top answer. Um, okay, well, so the way I describe it, oh man, there's so many different like frameworks that we could go down right now. I'd say one of the ways that I was told when I first started at Facebook by another uh, older RPM that I really resonated with was basically saying there are five key skills that basically a PM will use on the job. Uh, execution, which is basically like working with engineering, how can you scope things down, how can you like be firm, but also understanding to work with engineers. Um, your design skills, so how well can you think about the user problems and design a product. Vision, how can you motivate the team that to like not only focus on the day-to-day, -day, but also like this grand plan for how you're gonna change the world. Leadership, which is just generally like how how do you lead? Uh, how do you get people to enjoy what they're working on um, and get get things done? And then the fifth one is analytics. So just general like data aptitude, how well you think about data questions, what are the things that you want to know, how do you find those answers? And so the idea is every PM coming in because people come from such diverse backgrounds. Their spikes, or basically their level of each of those five skills, is going to be different. Like for me, coming in as a designer, my design skills were like higher than, let's say, like my analytics skills, for example. Whereas for someone more technical, it might be a different level. But the idea is a good PM has a baseline of all five of those skills, and beyond this baseline arbitrary level, it could vary. And every PM is going to have a different strength. Some are more visionary. Some are more ruthless prioritizers. Oftentimes, great PMs have both. Um, that's one framework of many to think about it. I don't know if you guys have other opinions. I have a simple answer. Yeah. I think the ability to learn. Um, at Facebook, and as an RPM, and especially at Facebook, you are with the smartest people in the world doing their jobs. Um, so I think of every day as like a learning opportunity. And I think learning within like these frameworks that are much more thought out than my answer is, is like great. Um, but I think there, if there's a day where you don't feel like you've learned, like you've done something wrong, um, and it's on you. So, and that might be learning something like from you from a different team. It might be like learning, like learning one of those muscles a little more. But I think the best PMs at Facebook, and like even our like super high like senior VPs who talk about this, just talk about always learning and how they like learn new stuff every day. And I think that's also part of like the PM's role is to teach about like what your team is doing. Um, Jasmine's actually talked really well in the past about like it's our job to understand it. <laughs> I've used your answer before. Mm -hmm. um, it's like our job to understand kind of what everyone else is doing too, to know how it affects our team, but also it's our job to like be the voice of our team in the same way, um, but learning. Um, I like the expression strong opinions weekly held. Because um, basically as a product manager, a lot of the time you have to have an opinion about something, but you also have to realize that as Lizzie said, there's a lot of really smart people at Facebook and you're not always going to have the right answer. So I like to always like, try to have an opinion about something, but also understand that you know it's a learning opportunity. You need to learn from everyone else's ideas and kind of take all that amalgamated and form your own opinion on top of that. So that's what I like. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my understanding of the interview process is that basically decisions are properly made by a committee. So I'm curious if do you actually get to talk to the person who would eventually be your manager ahead of time, or how does that generally work? Is that matched up after our PMs are chosen? Usually after. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's our standard product manager interview process, yeah. um, which is kind of cool, is that like we go through the exact same process. Um, but your rotation is decided well closer to your start date. Yeah. With the announcement of uh, Facebook, you know, uh, doing business in China, how much of that do you Feel, you know regularly on a daily basis and more, more in terms of the international um, aspect of things and then the culture overall of uh, the company. Uh, you bring up China as a specific example. I don't know if we can comment on that specifically, but 
in terms of international, certainly, you f like we, yeah, we take a lot of international trips as a result of just either one research trip. So we need to meet with the users in Mexico because we have their their social circles. What they find funny is different than what is found funny in Africa versus London versus. Cupertino, California. Um, so for us, it's really important to travel internationally just to, because our user base is two billion people around the world, um, and that's just for Facebook. Um, and the second thing is like we have product teams around the world. So like I went to London to meet with like our machine learning team there uh, because we have like hubs. So half my engineers were in London last time. Yeah, a lot of years <laughs> So I'm actually going to Singapore in a week, which is yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, the reason being is that uh, for game developers, it's a bunch of game developers located in different countries around the world. So Singapore, we're using that as our Asia hub for game developers. Um, but you can imagine, like as Jasmine said, with two billion people, it's kind of impossible to not think about problems around the world. Um, some teams have more focus on specific countries, some teams are just focused holistically, but you always have to consider pretty much people everywhere in the world. Uh, this question is probably directed for Jess and Lily, but coming from a non-technical background, do you find it challenging to work with engineers and developers and technical folks and try to convince them to, to work on you know, the product or whatever it is that the team is working on? No. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is something, I don't know if you were, like, what you thought of coming into it, but for me, I was, I was, um, it was on my mind, basically, being from a non-technical background, but I think, like, the, this goes back to, like, Facebook is full of smart people, like, you're not expected to be the top engineer on top of being the top product manager, on top of being the best data scientist on your team, like, that's why we form the teams and the structure. Your job as a PM is just to set the prioritizations and the vision to make sure the team is moving in the right direction. In terms of convincing people, oftentimes it's not an engineering question, maybe like a data or research question. Like, can you point to a reason for why what an engineer is working on at any given time is the most valuable thing? Um, but I've never wound up in a situation where I felt like my opinions weren't respected just because of my background, yeah. personally. No, and I, and I have a somewhat like technical background with analytics, but it no. Uh, I think everyone like it's it's interesting too because I was I was worried about working with designers. I was like I don't speak their language. I don't know if I'm gonna like be able to uh, like I was very concerned about that in some ways. Um, and everyone everyone also recognizes like people's strengths in the room um, and it plays to their strengths and also balances it. So I think I always say like part of the product manager role is like everyone has. Similarly, like what Mike was saying, like people have very strong opinions based on like what they know in like their areas. Like analysts will say, like this is what like will move the metric the most, right? Or design will say, like this is like the best design. Research will say, this is what people are saying the most in usability studies. And it's just about it's a balancing act of all of those things. Um, and generally, everyone in the room, I'd say like using data and not just like number data, but research data or like a fit, like if engineering is something going to take two days versus eight months, like the two days one might win. And so just balancing all those things, I think is more important than any like being able to read the code. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about like one of the most like difficult person that you had during your um, rotation and what did you do with that person to achieve your goals? <laughs> knowledge based on what they are saying. So I guess going back previously, like people, like the researchers might say, this is what we're hearing in every single usability study. So they might be very hard on their opinion, yeah. rightfully so. Okay. Um, so I think it's just all about compromise within all, within everyone, but okay. never like, if, if someone being a difficult person, I think this is any job, so I guess this is yeah. my last job too, is like, if there's enough people who are like, this person being difficult, like they will be fixed. Okay. Um, yeah, in my experience, like I've had difficult conversations with people who are very strongly opinionated. Um, Facebook has an expression, data wins arguments. Um, so a lot of the time, like, if you can get into tough conversations where you have an opinion, someone else has an opinion, they might be in conflict. But usually we try to find some data that can help mitigate this argument. So, you know, whether it's user research and like, you know, 30 
people said this, or if you have an experiment you can run and show that this is more like well received than this. Um, so we try and mitigate some of these things by having like a quantitative way to break a tie, essentially. I would also say that Facebook, I, I it's my first uh, company out of college, so I can't speak for other places, but what I found really um, surprisingly amazing about Facebook is just how open and receptive people are to feedback, both giving and receiving. So I can't really think of a specific instance where like I was like at odds with someone for over a long period of time because if I recognized it was a problem, I would just give them that feedback and likewise I received similar feedback and I think those really open walls where you know people aren't going to hate you and you feel very um, trusted to give your opinion I think is super productive as a company. So. I'd say that's another everyone thing. Goes through a con through a, everyone goes through a training called Crucial Conversations so that you are able to give and receive feedback. Cheryl Sandberg is very big on this training. It's now like outside of Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, back. Yeah, so I had a question about product reviews. So can you guys talk a little more about what those are the conversations about product reviews? Product reviews? Yeah, product reviews. And what kind of conversations you guys talk about? Yeah, they're different on every team. I found. Um, on my team, uh, there's like different flavors of product reviews. They could be roadmap reviews, which is like this is what we're focusing on over the longer half and why we're focusing on it. So um, leads might like test our assumptions or uh, question our strategy. There's kind of like decision reviews where it's like we're making this drastic metric trade off. Are we okay with this? Um, there might be like specific like actual like feature reviews those are more like for design crits though honestly might be like check-ins on my team at least these are kind of the different flavors um and i have my reviews with my vp um and typically what happens is there's just like presentation what's of interest to the vp will like drill down upon it's really just a space for you to get very actionable feedback um, and either get like validated on the strategy that you're working on or build an even better strategy with their feedback. Yeah, I think they're really different on every team. Yeah. Some of them, some people do them in like two week cadences with their VP, some people might do it ad hoc, like just when someone wants it. It's totally different on every team. Other than the rotation part, is there a difference in uh, between RPM and normal entry level PM in terms of day-to-day -day execution? Yeah. So I don't think we hire like level 3 PMs. I think all like new PMs have to go through the RPM program, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I'm not sure. Keep but, yeah. There's, so, like, we are the most entry level PM you can be at Facebook. Like, there isn't an equivalent not RPM. Um, but I think one of the cool things about being an RPM is that, like, our titles are product manager. Um, they aren't associate product manager. They are, we are product managers in the RPM program. Um, so there are like people on your team who might have no idea that you're an RPM. Like you are, you are the PM on your team. Um, you might. I think there's a difference between like if it's your first rotation, your scope is going to be small, or you've never been a PM before. Um, but I think that's similar. I would, I would hope that. And that what would be the after that, yeah. uh, does everybody go to the same career path? Yep. Yeah. You're product manager. Yeah. Back. What, what made you guys choose this role? Like, what <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Um, so for me, one of the main advantages or things that appeal to me about being a product manager is the ability to focus on breadth as opposed to depth. So again, coming from a technical background as an engineer, I think a lot about engineering problems and how to build things and what technologies, that sort of stuff. As a product manager, you have to think about business, design, legal, sales, like all engineering as well, like all these different challenges. So for me, that was really appealing. Um, that was kind of the reason I wanted to stick as being a product manager. Um. I think switching between switching from data science to PM was a really like scary shift for me. Data science was very comfortable. Uh, I think similarly, I, it was very execution. It was very like I kind of knew what my job was. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me was during my interview process the people that I met. Um, I remember coming out of my interviews. I was just like these are brilliant, kind humans. Um, I'm still friends with most of my like all of my interviewers, um, and I. People just speak really highly about working at Facebook, um, and the company culture I think is, I'm not biased at all, but I think it's fun. <laughs> um, and just the opportunity to learn. I really was just looking to learn more. Um, and I think, like Mike said, you you learn every day because you're working with so many different teams and every rotation is very different. Like you're learning, you might have a really design heavy rotation. Like 
I've been on very like infra analytics heavy rotations where like I never really talked to a designer because it just like wasn't in what my product was working on. So I think all of that, but the people. Yeah. For me, I'd say um, like I had a feeling I would enjoy a product based on my design experience, but um, really, like I said, like execution and making sure that. Uh, it wasn't just an idea, but it was actually something that people were using and was making an impact on people's lives. It was something I saw as like something of core responsibility of what a PM would do. Um, when I talk to some of my friends who are in difficult situations where they're considering maybe like engineer versus PM or design versus PM, I think like the big question to ask yourself is do you care about what is being built? And for me that seems more PM-y versus how it's being built, which to me seems more like design engineering. There are interesting challenges in both, but for me, I just personally enjoy more of like strategy, defining opportunities, defining vision, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we're hearing a lot about um, being kind of the voice of your team and setting that vision. Um, within the, your program, are there any people who perhaps are non-native speakers of English where there is, um, you know, they have difficulty maybe explaining your, uh, themselves and maybe the upcoming meetings like that, yeah. as well as yeah. people who are a bit more introverted and are just oh, yeah. not that strong personalities? Well, yeah, so there's, there's a huge variety of product managers. Um, so a lot of people will, let's say, lead by influence as opposed to leading by being the most extroverted and confident person in the room. Um, so some people prefer one-on-one -on -one meetings as opposed to big 20-person meetings. And so they'll have all their necessary conversations in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And they'll be able to you know, figure out, get people aligned with them, um, et cetera, in different scenarios. You know, people find out what works for them best. So we definitely have lots of people who come from you know, different countries around the world, um, you know, different backgrounds, different, different levels cultures. of cultures, different yeah. levels of ext extroversion versus introversion. Um, it's all about like people find what works for them. If you prefer small settings, if you prefer bigger settings, if you want to send emails instead, like I don't know, like, people find out what works for them, they play their strengths. I think similarly, like like was said previously, we're we are building products for two billion people. Um, we don't have the luxury of having every single PM be the same. It wouldn't work. Our company wouldn't be successful. Uh, it wouldn't work for the program. So like we are always looking for like diversity in every sense of the word. Um, because it's important to our products that we that we do that. The introversion and extroversion question I find particularly interesting for PM because something I noticed myself when I first started, or one of the challenges I had to adjusting to PM, um, is like sometimes you wake up and you just feel like introverted, right? Like you just don't for the people who are introverted or, or have had those moments, right? Um, and so for me, I had to get used to like like. I feel introverted, I look at my calendar and it's jam-packed with meetings and I know I have to be on that day and that's just, uh, it's just one of those things where it's like for the sake of the job, like you just have to do it. So like if you, if that does make you a little apprehensive about approaching PM, that's just something to think about. Um, but for me, it's just like kind of a, it's just part of the job. Like you just have to, you just gotta, you gotta do it. And I think um, knowing, I think like one of the great parts about Facebook is like our work-life balance. Um, so if, so I know I have days where it's like at the end of the day, I like, need to leave right when my meeting's over, I need to go home and just sit on my couch and like watch TV. And that's okay. Um, so people like are definitely also good about like setting boundaries like when they need to take like self-care time, when they need to when they like we oftentimes like work from home one day a week depending on your team. Um, so there's definitely opportunities for stuff like that too. Yeah. Well, I have a question for Justin. I know you have a small background in design. So I uh which works more on the ideation is how are you doing the interview and about the background for interview? Demonstrated your background in execution mm -hmm. and also the business sense. Yeah. Um, so I'd say like we we talked about kind of like the three flavors of interviews. There's product sense, which is like very designy, like you're gonna get up on the whiteboard and draw some draw something. Um, versus like execution like interviews and that's kind of like where you would show that that's less so like execution because you can't show someone that you would do a great job executing over the course of three months in a one hour interview but it's mostly just kind of like what's your logical approach to getting things done um, and I think like business and execution uh, skills come out in both of those types of interviews um, and also like interviews are, are just because it's so hard to like give the interviewer a sense of like 
your well-rounded skills. And so I think like we've done a good job in segmenting the interview in those different uh, arenas to basically try to get a sense for someone for what something is like. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much, to be frank. Because yeah. my background is also in UX design, so a lot of uh, suggestions I receive to transition to a PM is trying to think about how to do it as a PM want to execute the uh, project and lead the project also. Mm -hmm. um, we're focusing more on the, um, for the business part. Like, yeah. Will this actually be um, a yeah. project to this uh, company versus that okay. you know, that's for that? Yeah. I think the, for a designer, I think what's really helpful is like, let's say you have a beautiful design, if I ask you to go one step further and tell me like, if you could only work on one of the features that you design, which one would it be? And how are you making that decision? Is it based on metrics? Is it based on user problems? Um, and that kind of exercise I think is helpful, just getting very used to assuming you can't have it all and like if you could only have a bit of it, which one would you take and then how would you incrementally build? I think that's where the PM side of design comes in. Like how do you know you make the right decision? Yeah. Like what was success? So like, um, that more into your current project as a UX designer and one step ahead, um, that also gives count because I have to yeah. Sure. Yeah, and maybe like for something that you're working on, like what's the business goal? What is it fulfilling for the company? Why why are you working on it? Um, being able to have like not only the designer's perspective of how the user might interact with it, but having the company's perspective for how it's all helpful. Um, I'd say it's one way to exercise that. One more question. Okay. Uh, a different one. Um, so how do you appear to make a meeting be more effective? So for me, like if I have yeah. Uh, we are working on that skill all the time. Um, we go back to this prioritization in my mind. Um, if you're having a meeting without an agenda, without a goal that you want out of that meeting, you probably shouldn't be having it. Um, if you can do it over messenger, you can do it over email and that's like the preferred communication channel for your team, then you shouldn't do it. I also have the opinion that if you send more than five messages in a row about something, you should just meet the person and talk about it. Yeah. So it really is, there's always skills you are working on. I think also going back to like feedback is like we are always gathering feedback. Like I know my team pretty much like once a month is like, okay, are all of our meetings like useful? If I'm having weekly one-on-ones with someone, I might say, should we move this to bi-weekly? Should we do daily stand-ups? Like we don't have any set system in place. Um, but I think ruthless prioritization and always being able, always knowing that something's gonna change. Like if your, pro your project might change to a state where you need to do daily stand-ups or it might be in like a lull state where maybe you can do like bi-weeklies with like weekly email updates. I think always adjusting. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So one of the problems I struggle with, I'm not sure if as PM, Maybe because I talk with uh, IT as a designer, not as a PM, so I have less um, um, weight in their eyes. Um, so one of the challenges I'm having, with, because we don't have to yet for this project specifically, is our IT guys are so busy, and my project, unfortunately, is the least priority one. So I always have the problem where I will have a meeting with IT guys um, give them, this is the stack, this is what we want to focus on to improve. A week later they come to me like, oh, this is what we talked about. Um, they did a refreshment. So always like there's excuses for not doing the work. And you have to push them to, I know you have a tight schedule, but this is also part of your work. So as a PM, how do you solve similar problems? We're not asking this question is, I will kind of that is this question may be asked during the interview, and I still so fast don't have a good answer to it. <laughs> So uh, one of the nice things about being a PM is you typically have full um, knowledge of all the different projects that are going on. Um, that's again kind of part of your job is to understand what your team is working on, even some, what if some of the other teams are working on to see if it overlaps or intersects at all. So if you happen to come to this scenario where you're trying to get an engineer or an IT person or whomever to work on something and it seems like they're too busy or they don't have time, I think 
it's really up to you to question the prioritization. And if you agree with the prioritization, then what you're proposing you should understand they're not going to get to. If you don't agree with the prioritization, then you should definitely question it and be like, so it seems like you're working on this. Why do you think this is more important than this? Or like, and you have an honest conversation about it. Um, yeah. We ruthlessly prioritize a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, I think one of you guys mentioned that you guys had a background in data science and engineering and all that. So when you do this product management thing, are you also responsible for coming up with the concept things? Or is it like you just sort of ideate and throw all the mock-ups and things like that? Or you do also build those concepts? So I, I haven't touched code in like over a year now. Um, <laughs> I touched it last week. Oh, did you? <laughs> um, I mean, because as uh, you know, from our backgrounds, we all have different backgrounds, so there's no way we would expect PMs to be able to do that. And that's why we build out our teams as such. Um, there'd be no expectations upon you to build a prototype of something. If you want to, for you know, your own reason, and you think it's effective, you can, but there'd be no expectations. And as I said, like in my year at Facebook as a product manager, I haven't needed to do any of this work. Um, yeah. I will say something that does come up is like, for whatever reason, like let's say, your designer recently left on paternity leave or like someone switching teams, data scientists are switching teams, your job as the PM, like built into the understanding of your role is like to fill in by any means necessary. So like if a situation arises where like you're, you don't have a data scientist, but like that's a crucial, you can't go a month without really understanding what's going on with your product, you might have to be the one to jump in. So it really depends on our needs basis, but I, yeah. On the whole, like like I said, we hire very smart people, and they're amazing at their jobs, and we trust them at what they do. Yeah. yeah to be clear, the code I changed was to like change the color of something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah, like jumping in on roles super. Like my team, we our data scientists went on maternity leave last half. It happened, um, and because I had data science background, like I was comfortable kind of jumping in and being like, okay, like I'll look at the tables, so I'll do this, I'll monitor. It. Mind you, they are way more brilliant than I am, and like we kind of just like got by for that one. But you definitely jump into those roles sometimes. So, um, so yeah, I guess. Go ahead. Let's follow up. So, how early on in the whole cycle do you like the second technology stack? Are those decisions taken by you, or is it like a discussion you facilitate and then you just sort of get the engineer to decide that? Like the architecture design. So, I mean, typically we lean on engineers to help us with this. Um, like in terms of how early it's decided, often how you're gonna build something influences the timeline for that project. So usually we'll rely on engineers to say this will take me two weeks versus this will take me two months. Um, but again, this is kind of like project specific, team specific, yeah. It can change any day. Yeah. Um, so would you say then that it's, uh, to kind of rewind a little when you were talking about the qualities for a, the ideal mm -hmm. candidate or something. Um, oh, you're saying like not ideal candidate, but well, just what I find. <laughs> right, like, right, yeah. Right. I don't want to scare people with that. Beneficial. Idea. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, would you say that it's highly beneficial to be sort of a, a jack of all trades rather than a master of one or two? And you were mentioning, you know, kind of filling in different holes. Um, how many additional skills have you guys picked up, or would you say you've learned over the you know, the first year or two of the program, um, you know, what, what have you added to your repertoire during that time? I think going in and like within the interview process, I don't think it's like jack of all, like I don't think it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. I think it's like how you reflect your previous work. So I don't think it's like, if you have no analytics background, like don't try and go home and like learn all the analytics stuff in the world, right? Like that's not, it, it's about like your willingness to learn. I think what Jasmine was speaking to was also like, you will learn these things, and that's like what we do. And it's it's, it's important, I think, to know where you stand in all of them. Um, just like that self awareness is really important, but not to be like one or the other. And then what was your second question? Skills we've added to our repertoire. Oh God. <laughs> I'd say uh, for me, um, I'm on a growth team right now, which is inherently Mikey was also on a growth team, so speak to all the data nuggets that we learned throughout the entire half. But on a growth team, like. It's very opposite from what I was used to as a designer. It's very much like, what's the hackiest thing we can build and implement in the quickest way? Run an experiment, let's learn, and let's iterate on that. And so it's very data heavy, very like experiment design and setup. Um, and so that's something that like I didn't know if I would like it coming into the rotation from based on my background, but I actually like it a lot. And actually my manager was a designer and then he turned into a very growthy PM because he himself was interested as a designer to find like a right answer. And like Mikey said, data wins argument. 
arguments. So the fact that I'm so like immersed in it is really fascinating to me just to um, to learn, I guess, another side of how to prioritize and make decisions. I think when you think about skills, there's kind of two buckets. You have the buckets that you are common across PMing on any position. So this is like communication skills you're constantly working on, uh, how to lead a team, how to motivate people you work with. These are common things you continue to get better at. And then there's some of the more specific things, like for Jasmine's case, she's on growth, she's doing a lot of data stuff, this is new. Uh, for myself right now, I'm working with a lot of, I'm working with game developers, and it's, it's different from thinking about what users want and now thinking about what developers want. Um, and there's a trail between how we get the best set of features for developers, but also create the best user experience in the end. So that's like a completely different opportunity that I've never thought about before. Right. I mean, if you pick up like game design or something like that, <laughs> I mean, working with a lot of, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how deep into the technical stuff you, you just sort of innately pick up just from your interfacing and everything else on the job. I'm just kind of curious. I know a lot about spam now. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I think they're subject matter expert like at everywhere, but I, but I think the bigger skills you learn are the ones that are applicable kind of across. Like, yes, he's working on like games and like developers versus users, but it, like, for example, like on events, which is what I'm on right now, like it's it's a two-sided market, right? With people who make events and with people who consume events. Like, it's a, it it even though our teams are like yeah. on the surface very different, I'm feeling we're probably doing similar things. Yeah. In terms of the skill set, there's like skills and then there's like industry knowledge and they're kind of different. So, and I think like. This is the interesting thing about the RPM program, you're working in different product spaces, like industries and product problems. So it just depends on which skills you pick up from those problems. So. Yeah. Um, for the RPM program, do you have or, and or would you accept people with advanced degrees? I have <laughs> <laughs> I have a master's in computer science. Oh PhD. So we have people coming from MBA. Um, I don't know if we have any PhDs. You totally us. be open to that. It's not a function, <laughs> it's just function, we just haven't had uh, it's yeah. a fact that we haven't had one, not that we wouldn't take one. So again, I'm also not confident that we haven't had one. I'm but not, no, 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 Yeah, but definitely like, I don't know, like MBAs, uh, masters, like all different types of backgrounds. There's no like hard requirement. Yeah. Okay, because I was told that didn't apply to that PhD. Oh. So I don't know. Talk to us after. <laughs> yeah. We don't. Yeah, I'll go ahead and that. Well, thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Max. Uh, I noticed that you've got a 4.8 out of 4 at Stanford. Why? Where is that information? How did you find that? My first I did not know. How did you do that? <laughs> 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 okay, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, because I, I understand this. I come from Carnegie Mellon. And the second question is, the second question is um, in this background of technology, you may have more option in the path of technology to make more difference to the world. So why do you choose this role instead of becoming an algorithm scientist with open AI? Okay, uh, first question, <laughs> GPA question. <laughs> uh, so Stanford is officially on a 4.0 scale, but there are some classes that offer A pluses, and A pluses are 4.3 out of 4.0. Um, so throughout my... <laughs> Throughout my, throughout my master's degree, I averaged um, above, in between an A and an A plus because of some courses that offer A pluses. My GP was not that <laughs> <laughs> um, And your second oh, question about- Thank you for asking that. <laughs> <laughs> um, your second question about why did I choose PM as opposed to OpenAI or some other type program. Um, going back to some of the previous comments we've made, Facebook has two billion people. That's a lot of people that you can affect change with. Um, and those types of opportunities are hard to come by. You know, you think about different technologies you can work at, different technology stacks you can work on, being able to affect change for two billion people, that's like that's a very, very unique opportunity. Um, and especially going back to the role as a product manager, it is your job to affect change for some facet of their lives. Um, for each of us, we have slightly different positions in what we're working on and what that change means. But again, it's like you focus on breadth of problems and you come up with the direction you think your team should take. So it's definitely within your power to affect some level of change for two billion people. Great, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So just follow up questions on the interview process. Is Not on his GPA. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a deep 
as well interviewing do you like consider candidates like you know I've, I've seen uh, at a lot of places they would either strictly take you know people from India roles and now I know you just talked about you know you have a computer science background but somebody who's already had let's say been working as a you know QA engineer or a software engineer for like let's say five six years yeah. and then uh, does Facebook does that oh this guy already probably has a very rigid mindset uh, for that kind of a role so you might not be a good uh, fit for uh, PM role, he, you know, because as a as a pressure out of the college, or otherwise, you know, it's easier for a person to bend his mind towards, you know, the Facebook culture of PM. Do you, do you think that kind of like uh, some in some way affects the candidate's profile? So, so we, I'd say, have about half our candidates each year who have who have been out of school um, in variety of capacity. I think uh, people range up to like five to seven years of experience in a variety of things. We have someone who is an aerospace engineer in my class for like three years. We have people Teach for America. TFA. We have people who, like it, it's a super wide range of backgrounds and people come from all over. Um, we have people who did something else then like maybe did like PMS startup for a year but are five, six, seven years out of school um, and then move into the program. So there's no, I think like that might be a personal concern of like are you know it, it's a learning program and like you have to be willing to learn that's like one of the biggest fundamental core values that we have but if you are able to like reflect that in your interview process there's no like disadvantage at all. And small question on that you know and, and software engineering uh, interview is very easy they give you a code you write the code okay it's all that it's, it's more like quantitative. It, it, PM roles is more qualitative, so what are the qualities that you would like specifically, I know we've uh, talked generally about a lot of things, but like specifically, you know, during an interview process, what goes on in your mind as you know, you're like evaluating a candidate? So I think like one thing that uh, comes up pretty frequently, no matter what capacity, what interview, is like your ability to think critically about a problem. Whether that's like a leadership, you know, how you're working with this team, or whether it's a product, or whether it's like you know executing on a team, um, the ability to like kind of question assumptions and think critically is really really important. Um, that's one thing that comes to mind. Yeah, I think it might not be as like quantitative as you say, like a engineering interview, but it's yeah. still like it seems to be like very logical, right? Like it's yeah. it's like a problem. It's a different type of problem you're solving, but still a problem. So I wouldn't say like there's specific like soft skills, like of course like communication, framing, can you be structured and articulate, that's all very important, but at the end of the day it's just very much like, yeah, like do you have a structured approach? Yeah, I, I was gonna say, important thing to think about is like, if you, if I was to ask you like, tell me about an, an idea for a product you have, if I lead this conversation be like, that's a really good idea, that means you've done your job, and however you get from there, from point A to point B, like being as, I'm a pretty logical person myself, I would kind of really on some of the details and see like what about this, what about this. Um, different interviewers, different backgrounds, but again it's like can you take me along your like sequence of thoughts and can you make me believe in your idea? And if the answer to that is yes, then that's, that's a good interview. I think back to the communication piece, being able to adjust, so like I think sometimes, I know I was, I definitely struggled with like getting feedback and being like oh no, 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 like I'm going on my way, but it's okay to, I think if, if someone asks like a follow-up question, it's okay to either like agree with them, but also know why you're agreeing with them. Don't agree with them just to agree with them. Like it's very much how we operate in our jobs. Of like, if someone says like, "Oh, you should do this," you either say like, "Okay, this is why I think you're having me do this." Like, let me like walk through like their reasoning, or be like, "No, I'm still going to do this." Walk me through my reasoning. Yeah. And kind of adjusting all the way. Is there anyone here that has questions? I feel like I've been looking. Yeah, you've been raising your hand for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think being a little bit late, so I might miss some uh, part of the. So I basically have two questions. The first question is you guys are from tech background, so in a job, like how much percent of the background do you have background do you use in the current job? And uh, like how does that help? And uh, because I'm not from the tech background, so I'm wondering like if I'm not from tech background then like and uh, my second question is like for the interviews so how do you prepare for the interviews like is there any specific place you can go to to find like kind of questions you can take practice on for the interview yeah. uh, so 
just for uh, quick context, I'm actually the only one with the technical background. Uh, well, computer science background. Um, so Lizzie comes from like a data analytics background, and Jasmine comes from more of a design background. Um, so in general, Facebook product managers come from a variety of different backgrounds, and they bring their own expertise with the palms of hand. Uh, so for myself, I, to be quite honest, use my technical background very little. Because um, one of the great things about Facebook is you have really strong people you work with across all different job functions. So a lot of the engineers I work with are very strong. And if I actually get involved in what they're doing and try to understand it, it's actually not a good use of my time. Um, and I'm better off just like not knowing the details and just letting them figure it out and thinking more about some other aspects. Yeah, I don't think having a technical or not technical background hurts or helps. I think it's just how you frame your previous experience. Um, yeah, and it's not so much like using a certain percentage of your past background, but rather like it, it's like shape the way you think and interpret problems and products. Um, so I can't give you like a percentage, but it's just like kind of, it's part of your story. Yeah. You know what I mean? um, and then in terms for how to prepare, Glassdoor has some questions. So, <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> so like if you want to find some questions for like past interview questions, I'm out there. Yeah, what I recommend is like if you have friends who are product managers, um, go through the exercise of picking a product to use and thinking critically about it. If you were the product manager on this product, whether it be an app, whether it be like a hardware product, whatever, what would you improve on it? What do you think is working well? What do you think is not working well? And that actual act of going through thinking about it critically, explaining your thought process to someone else, I think will do a, long, uh, a lot of good to help you prepare for interviews. As a follow-up to that question, did you take any mock interviews or uh, practice the questions from the books that are available online? I think practicing with someone is... I think, yeah, I think in general people prepare very differently though. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on where you are in your career, it depends on who who you know. Like Some people don't know any PMs, so, like, they're the only ones to do it, so like, they might just do a lot by themselves. I think working with someone who might be in a similar role or who might work with people in similar roles is always helpful. Um, but I think everyone, like if you ask all 30 of us right now how prepared, every single answer would be different. And how many RPMs do you think some higher of these two? If you can't give the exact number, um, you can, I don't know. There's, There's about 30 of us around right now in three classes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in your program, when you guys set schedules, is that kind of a fixed uh, decision? Because you, you mentioned that things change over time. Is it kind of a situation where like, we're going to do whatever it takes to meet these milestones and deadlines? Or is it more kind of like, you know, we plan the work and kind of work the plan as things change? Like, like, like how, how, how set in stone is a schedule that you guys set for your teams? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of aspects to that question. Um, I think one, in general, it's good to have a sense of where your team is heading. Um, it's good to have, like, typically, like, at least for the next month, kind of where you think your team is heading. But these are generally never rigid because things come up all the time. Um, and so it's, like, important to understand, like, one, where you think the project should head, but also understand that things can happen and you need to be able to react to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, in general, for Facebook as a company, nothing is really rigid. It's just, yeah, things move all the time, people change roles, like your product has a new, if someone has a new idea that comes up and you think it's greater than what you were currently working on, so you change a bunch of stuff, but it, it happens all the time. I think also, like, you, you might set goals, like metric goals, and generally, if you want to change a metric goal, you're going to have a really good reason to, but how you get there might change a lot, um, is also how I think about it. Yeah. But if you have to change a metric goal, you change it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what challenged you all individually about the interview process? Like when you're waiting, what was the most challenging to each of your products? And I have a second question and I'm going to ask that later. Yeah. Uh, it's probably like a, a satisfying answer, but for me, I think it's frankly just confidence. Um, I think like um, to prepare around specific questions, specific type of questions, I think you're never going to be able to fully predict. So for me, a much more effective prep strategy was just to like trust my intuition and like uh, the way my mind thinks about problems. And rather, like I would practice with my friends for sure. But for me, one of the more challenging aspects was just like how do I exude this confidence that a PM would typically have in an interview? Um, how do I 
be receptive to feedback? How do I think about ideas quickly? How do I quickly like uh, give reasons for why I'm focusing on what I'm focusing on? Um, more of like the soft skills and just the general like headspace of an interview was probably uh, the most important and most challenging for me. Yeah, for me it was the, the leadership type interview um, because I was used to being an intern and working on teams that other people had set up. So I see the culture that some other product manager has set up for the team. But actually when you start thinking critically about like how do you motivate people? That's like a really tough question to answer, especially if you're coming like my, I was straight out of uh, straight out of college. So that was, I think, um, probably the, the, the interview that I struggled the most with or had the most amount of difficulty with. That was the leadership. Yeah, mine was definitely the product sense one. <laughs> um, I think going from analytics background, I was just like, wanted numbers for everything. Um, and I remember like whiteboarding something and then being like, so you really want 12 buttons on one page? And I was like, oh no, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> um, but I think also knowing when, I think like the soft skill wise was like knowing when to stop. Like you're giving an answer and just because they're not interrupting you doesn't mean you need to keep going. Um, I think like the being concise and being clear, it's important to be like, okay, I'm answering your questions and now I'm done talking. And I struggle with that skill in general, so they can vouch. Um, so that was like just something that I need to be really aware of as well. Uh, I kind of follow up. Uh, what was one thing that really uh, was unexpected or surprising when you went into the PM position at RPM? Like, what was like, oh my god, I did not expect this at all? Um, so quite frankly, I was kind of surprised at how much responsibility I had on day one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I kind of assumed that like I don't know I'd be handheld for like, some <laughs> portion of time in the program and like they really try to they throw you out the nest and make <laughs> you fly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so like we do have an orientation. We have like a four four week what we call boot camp, which is like how to space of work, how to do camp work. Um, but then from day one on my team after the four week, um, I was instantly giving a lot of responsibility. I was instantly given a lot of faith and a lot of trust. Um, and I was I was actually pretty surprised that like yeah. I had people who had been interviewing the Facebook for like five years being like, hey, what do you think we should work on? Or like, what is your what is your thoughts about this? And I was like, I just joined this team. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think going along with that, um, a to be clear, like there is a net underneath you yeah. where like your your manager and your operating like PM will be there for you. Like they will not let you fall flat on your face. Um, but also I think it's a very big Facebook culture thing, where just because you're new doesn't mean you aren't valued. Um, like they say on the first day, like this is now your company. So we also say like if you see something, fix it. Uh, like nothing is somebody else's problem. We like keep going with like Facebook sayings. Um, but the, the new opinion is not the, the person with five years of experience. I think this is like the beautiful thing about Facebook culture. They want to know your opinion because they've been in the weeds for five years and they know they're not seeing something. Like they know that someone who like has thought about this from an excellent perspective, who doesn't know all the like technical limitations and doesn't know what we tried a year ago, will like come and ask the hard questions day one, and that across the board, like RPM, PM, whatever your function is, exists. Like just because you're new doesn't mean that you aren't valued. In some ways, people will turn to you and be like, "Hey, we've been trying to solve this problem for two months, and none of us have good answers. Like, what's your crazy idea?" Yeah, I would also say like similar along the same vein, like I think it's more like recognizing that you, people are like looking to you despite you're new. I think one of the things I was most surprised about being both a new grad and new to Facebook, I was kind of like very acutely aware of like the seniority levels and like the levels of the people who have been at Facebook longer um, and even just like above me, like my VP's opinions. I went into one product review where it was like very chaotic in terms of like discussion. Uh, and then after the review, my designer like turned to me and was like, you know, feel free to like take control of it because we're like looking to you to be the person to like provide that direction, even if you're new. And I think that was like a very impactful conversation for me because uh, I think I was waiting to be invited to like have that autonomy when I just realized day one like it's mine and I don't have time to waste to like think about yeah to wait. Thank you. There's another question. Yeah. So I have a question on uh, the fact that you were telling that people from different backgrounds and also experiences come into this uh, rotation program. Have you ever seen a PM from another company come to a rotation program? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So typically, we we want to keep PMs who come in externally for our PM program to have less than two years total of experience. Um, but 
in the class that was started six months ahead of mine. I think there was three. There's two in my class. There was two in your class. So there's, there's a bunch that come in that have like one year PM experience at a different company or something like this. Yep. Yeah. yeah. What was the most difficult interview question you had? And how do you go about it? So we can't talk about civic interview questions. Um, I think we've all kind of discussed like our difficulties and where we felt like good challenges. Yeah. No, the great question. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the ways you guys have gone about uh, researching and finding user needs, and have any methods um, to that? I think this is one of the hardest uh, and most exciting parts of the product development lifecycle because it's so open-ended. It's like you're searching for the answer to then execute on. Uh, we have like a very extensive like research team on my team. We have qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers. The difference being qualitative will like sit in a lab with the user right in front of them and watch them use the product. Quantitative being like what are some survey questions we can run and run across all of Facebook to get uh, some feedback at scale. Um, and so this is something that we leverage on top of that like we have a ton of data and it's all about like how can you make the data work for you to answer the questions that you need to know. So leveraging both the research and data is kind of how we're able to then uncover opportunities within, the, within our metric that we're trying to grow. I would say the most eye opening for me has been like some of the more qualitative work though. I think we look at numbers a lot and we I think sometimes a super important part of PM is to have empathy for like an individual user because um, we have two billion. So even if you're working on a small product at Facebook, like you are talking about hundreds of thousands of people yeah. at minimum. Ten percent is still a big like, number. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think sometimes like having five people come in and have it's just like five random people and have them all like I had an experience where they people were scrolling and they scrolled past it every time. Right? And our metrics were like super low and we were like, oh, like our click through is like really, really low. And we were like trying to figure out why, like what's going on. And when we saw people using it, like that's something that you can't get from numbers. We saw people using it, they literally didn't see that it was there. Like they just kept scrolling. And we were like, hey, do you see that? And we're like, what? It was a normal post. Like it was not. <laughs> so, um, so that like for me at least, that was really eye opening for me being from such a quantitative background to be like, that is not something that you see with numbers. You don't see five random people come in and all have the exact same problem. Yeah. Like it was eye opening. So that was for me at least like one of the coolest. Yeah. It was really cool. Uh, one of my rotations, I was on the registration flow for Instagram, um, which is really interesting to think about from a product perspective. Um, not, probably not a lot of people think about registration flows, but <laughs> it's actually really interesting. Um, and like for people generally in America, like if they want to sign up for Instagram, they'll make an account. Like they don't typically get stuck on the registration flow. But what we would do is we went to developing markets around the world, and we would speak with people who are maybe new to the internet. Like they've never used a phone before, they've never on the internet before, and for them, going through a registration flow is vastly different than how you or I go through a registration flow. Um, and in this case, there's no way. I could even begin to understand the problems without user research. And even like within America, it's like I would struggle to find someone who has never used a phone or never used the internet before. Um, so for that, like, we literally had to go into the field and we had to go do some emerging markets around the world um, and do in-home user research to meet these people. So we like on social media users, what are some of the data privacy or those sort of decisions you've ever had to make so far in your and this is also some of the decisions we have to make, right? So in general, we protect data like very, very, very carefully. Um, like we would never trade off someone's no. personal data against some anything. product feature or anything. Um, yeah, so typically you're not making these type of trade-offs because the answer is no. Like you, like yeah. this is like this is the most one of the most important things for Facebook as a company mm -hmm. is to make sure people feel trusted. Like they trust Facebook when they use the app, they know that we're not going to maliciously use their data or do anything else with it. Uh, what's the most spoken language that you That's that you're not gonna like. 
I think there's like different types of fulfilling. So I think there's like, like the first time that I felt like in a meeting, I think kind of like what Jasmine said before, that I felt like, I remember this was probably, I was definitely like giving my opinion day one, like, like we said earlier, like that's very valid, but there was a meeting where it was like, we either have to do this or this, and I had to like make the decision, and people literally, like I was turned and looked at me, and I was like, oh man, like this is crazy. Um, so that was like one of those things where like the decision was not a big deal, and like it was a couple weeks in, and I'd say like I made way bigger decisions later on, but that was the most fulfilling and like, oh, this is real, I'm actually doing this. Um, so I think there's like that personal, that, that for me is like the thing where I look back and it was our like weekly stand-up meeting that we had every week for six months that like we made much crazier decisions in later on. But it was the first one where I said, like I remember the decision was, we had two options for a design and the data was like fine either way. And I said, okay, if the really good design takes less than two weeks, there's one that was clearly a nicer design. If that one takes less than two weeks, we'll do it. Cause the other design we knew would take us about three hours. And that was like the first time where I was like, I am making a trade-off right now. Like, design, engineering. And it was the first, like, you, you're making decisions constantly, but it was the first one for me that was like super concrete. So that was like personal fulfillment. We went with the two week one because it was only going to take four days. <laughs> uh, for myself, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, as a product manager, a lot of times you're ultimately responsible for your team's success. Um, as Jasmine talked about filling in different roles, like it's, a lot of times it's ultimately up to you to make sure your team is on a good trajectory and you're helping out with the most important things. Um, so I remember during my second rotation, my team was in a rough spot for about a month and a half. Um, and we were coming close to the end of the half and typically, you know, for our program we're on six month intervals. So I'm coming close to the end of my rotation. I'm like, crap, like my team is really not in a good spot right now. Um, and we were struggling, we were struggling, we didn't know what to do. We had some ideas that weren't working as we initially thought. Um, and then, it wasn't even my idea, someone else had this great idea. And as soon as we tried it, everything kind of turned around and we ended the half on a great note. And that was like, going from that like low spot where you have like a bunch of people you work with who are like, they're, they're, they know the team's on a good spot and you're really internalizing it because you're the product manager of the team. Taking that and then uh, changing trajectory and ending in a really great spot was like, by far the most fulfilling thing I've experienced in Facebook. I think on top of personal fulfillment, like Lizzie talked about, for me, one of the most like product-wise fulfilling things was like uh, the, my first launch day when we were launching the product. We were in a war room and we like flipped the switch. We had a dashboard, and then the, like after launch, the metrics went way up. We were refreshing a Google query that was just like. Um, in the news tab because we were looking for the articles to come out and then we saw the TechCrunch article come out we were just like, holy shit, this is real. Um, it was so exciting. And, that, and then like when I saw like my friends using the product in my news feed, that was like a really, I think like that's a very special Facebook experience. Like only because we work at Facebook we can like really see, see that, see that in the wild. It was awesome. Uh, I'm curious if did any of you guys have a previous experience like trying to get a product like an app or something, or leadership experience, like running a club or something in college, that gave you some context for being able to find leadership interviews. Yeah, I attribute a lot of my, the reason why I went to PM to that. So in college, um, some friends and I started an incubator on campus for startups, basically just to provide mentorship, support, funding to a lot of the startups in the space. And that was kind of the first time where uh, we recognized a problem and you know, there's a lot of problems where you say like someone should do something about it and it was the first time where we were like, we are going to be the ones to do something about this. And you learn a lot throughout that process. It's very similar, I think, to what a PM goes through. I think that's one of the most valuable prep experiences you could get to know if PM is something that you want to do. Um, and I also think that that kind of self-starter attitude serves you very well um, as a PM. I think even doing like non-technical stuff, like I like started a student org about like mental health support in college that like even like just working with different stakeholders, right? Like we had to work with like our counseling and psychological services and with like student orgs and with student government to get funding. Like just that like cross-functional, even though like who my cross-functional partners are has changed dramatically. That experience, like I spoke about it a ton during my interview process because it like defined me as a leader, I think. Um, in my case, I did a bunch of hackathons throughout college. So those are an opportunity to be like a mini product manager for your hackathon idea. So we had a lot of not so great ideas. Uh, <laughs> but like throughout all this, you learn along the way like what works, what doesn't work, um, 
How long does it take to build? Can you finish it in time? When you're explaining to someone else why you made this, can you succinctly do so and convince them that it's a reasonable idea? All those like the same, like very similar things we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's do three more questions. Three. Who has it? In the way back in anything like any risk, any problem decision that you do, or uh, your manager just did that fail and how was that made with that fail? Did uh, it fail? Yes. I, I mean, I think I would be surprised if an RPM has never like had a failure at all. It's almost mm -hmm. like, if, again, if, like, if you don't right fail, yeah, if you don't fail, you're almost like not doing it right because you shouldn't be taking a conservative approach that you know are going to succeed at all the time because that's not how you have, like, that's not how you drive a lot of impact. Um, so generally, like I've made countless poor decisions throughout my <laughs> throughout my time as an RPM, um, but through those, you're always learning throughout the process. Like, what was wrong about the decision in hindsight? Um, and generally, it's very well received. Like, people will encourage you to fail again because it's a learning program, and they know the best way to learn is through failure. And your team around you, like, they won't expect every single thing you say to be 100% accurate or like the best decision you could make. They they realize that like you know you can't know always what two billion users are going to like. Um, and they know that you will have to fail sometimes in order to succeed in the long run. Sorry, you, you, you get down to the revival. Well, you have a, I mean, you have a six month rotation, so typically, like, even if you fail once, you have more than enough time to try something else or, um, yeah. We have, a, we have a phrase that's move, so it used to be move fast and break things. It's, no, it's, it's now just move fast um, because people were taking that quite too early at Facebook and like trying to break down the site. Um, but you're encouraged to move fast and if you haven't made a bad decision, you probably aren't moving fast enough. It's also the difference between making one mistake once and the same mistake twice. So I would like be careful of the latter, but the former is very much encouraged. Yeah. So I want to know, like, uh, think about the day when you joined and today, what have you changed? Deep. <laughs> I like it. How have you changed? Start. <laughs> um, I think for myself, confidence has changed a lot. Um, just in terms of, like, again, my going back to my original point about strong opinions really held, I. I generally feel more secure in the decisions I make, knowing that if I have to change them, I will. But a lot of the time, like, you can build upon previous experiences you had. Even though I've only been at Facebook for a year, I've had a lot of ups and downs. So now I feel more confident that, like, oh, I've seen this in the past. Maybe this is similar. So I have some idea of what to do in this scenario. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it's about this confidence. OK, OK. I, I would say, like, Similar, same answer, different reasons, confidence. Um, and it's something that like I think I'm continuing to work on because I'll never be done really. I think like uh, particularly where I've seen being at Facebook help me with that, I think a lot of our product leaders, like one of the reasons why Mark is such an effective CEO is because if you present him with two options, he just has an intuition to like look ahead magically and like know what the right answer is, or at least like what a very well articulated answer is. And that skill takes a lot of confidence and like own personal belief in like how you make decisions and where you see the world headed. Um, same with Kevin Sistrom, head of Instagram. Like he has a very strong idea for like what Instagram is and what Instagram isn't. And he has the confidence to like let go of some opportunities because he's like, that's not what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And so I think like recognizing that as a PM that is very much needed for your job is something that um, because I see it in leaders and it's something that's very top of mind for me every single day. It's something I've improved and continue to improve on since day one. I think mine's like slightly more tactical. I've learned how to like have an unfinished checklist. Mm -hmm. So I go into every meeting and come out with three things to do. Like I feel like I go you're like you go into a meeting and you're two more people you need to be there. Um, and I think going back to the, the prioritization, I was always someone who felt like I had to do everything all the time. Um, and as a PM, you just you can't. And you like you can't know everything and you can't know the answer to everything. Like I've gotten feedback that I like dig too much into the weeds because I like, want to know how it all works. And that like isn't like letting go of that is really was really hard for me at first. Like I wanted to know how everything worked, and it's like our systems are not simple, and 
like similarly, we've engineers who have been on teams for like three, four, or five years, and they don't know how all of it works. So like, I'm clearly not the person to do so. So I think a like personal growth thing for me has been like leaving at the end of the day and not. I think I was used to like very executional role, like oh, you need to like build this dashboard or do this analysis or do this, and that's like no longer the role I'm in. So learning how to have an unfinished checklist has been. And like changing the checklist. Like if something's been on the checklist for a week and it hasn't been done, it's not great. Yeah, it probably need to be there. Last question? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You've been raising your hand for a while. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Where do you feel like okay. That's okay. Uh, one is, uh, do you, does the RPM programming stuff that we do go like a little bit more intensively on the road back from the college? Like where do you see funding? Yep. And then also, I really would love to know if the art program like um, is referenced in a way that like the products that we're looking at here seem to be really helpful asset. And for this, if you guys can go on that program, how do you guys like go on the program? Yes, we definitely. I mean, like we've been saying, like diversity is like very important to us, and we do us the program, the company, no service if we are. It's very rigid in the archetype of a PM. So for any of those kind of questions, the answer is like, yes, we will definitely consider those people as long as they like attribute like these skills, have like the self sort of attitude, et cetera. Um, in terms of like how we build diversity, I mean, diversity is very important to us. I think if you saw all 30 of us standing up here, you would see that diversity is very important to the program. And also like we've been talking about to Facebook and the products that we build, we serve 2 million people around the world. We need to be diverse just to like survive and to have people enjoy our products. And that doesn't mean that's like diversity of people, diversity of culture, diversity of where you're from, diversity of personality, the, uh, diversity of sharing behavior. You know, it's all very important. I, I'm on the sharing team. Yeah, um, it's all very important. So, yes, yeah, yeah.